This is Jeremy Martin, and welcome to another of the La Jolla Energy Conference Deep Dive series. Uh, we are, as everyone knows by now, celebrating the 30th anniversary of the La Jolla Energy Conference. We're celebrating all month long in May, and as part of that, we have organized a, a series of interesting conversations, panels, and recorded discussions with thought leaders on different topics that we think are deserving of a little bit more time and attention than uh, a panel during the course of the proceedings. And today, we're very happy to have with us Savine Hufnagel, who is with ERM, Environmental Resources Management, who everyone watching probably knows is a longtime supporter sponsor of the La Jolla Energy Conference. And it's a, it's a great pleasure. We haven't met Sabine before, but we're meeting you today. Thanks for joining us for this series. Great to be here, Jeremy. Thank you. Thanks for having me. No, we really appreciate it. ERM always brings such unique insights and you, uh, your team in Mexico, but all over the region have been great partners. And so we, uh, we really appreciate uh, folks like Jaime Martinez and Alberto San Bartolome, Vivian Gianotti. So thanks to ERM again. Uh, Sabine is the Global Director of Services, Brand and Communications and a member of ERM's Global Executive Committee. She's uh, an executive, uh, experienced project director with more than 25 years of professional experience in social performance management corporate strategy, human rights, international development, and has worked worldwide providing clients both in the public and private sector at all levels. I think it's important to also note that she um, she's leading ERN's own, ERM's own sustainability commitments, represents ERM at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and leads ERM's internal global human rights and business network. So it won't surprise anyone with that introduction to note that we will talk about sustainable development goals in the RM's work on the SDGs as they're known. So Sabine, let's let's jump right in here. Um, I think the question, we've all heard the, the, the acronym SDGs by now, the Sustainable Development Goals. ERM has analyzed the progress of the SDGs since their introduction five years ago. Uh, I always like to start these kinds of interviews setting the table. So where are we today on the SG, SDGs? Uh, and, and perhaps a second part to that question, what progress has been made in those five years? Great. Um, I mean, maybe to, to start off, um, you know, to explain that ERM was involved in the development of the SDGs uh, by way of our membership of uh, a number of organizations that were representing business in, in the process, um, including the, the World Business Council of Sustainable Development, but also the UN Global Compact and, and GRI. And, and very early on, we determined how we as a business would make a contribution to the SDGs. And, and the way we do that is firstly through the work that we do with our clients, uh, but we also walk the talk um, in our own operations. Um, and then we collaborate with, with other organizations, um, but also includes our, our corporate foundation where we align all of our activities specifically to the NDGs. Um, as part of that wider contribution, um, we also regularly publish insights on, on the SDG and on, and on their progress. And specifically through the Sustainability Institute, along with Globescan, we have recently published our, our third survey on progress on the SDGs. We did this in 2017, in, in 2019, and now in 2021. Um, and that survey is conducted through polling around 500 sustainability experts from around the world um, in, in academia, in business, in uh, services, in media, in NGOs, uh, as well as governments. 10% um, of the responses came from professionals in, in Latin America. Um, and about 29% from, from North America. What I would say in terms of progress at a high level before uh, you know, COVID-19 happened, we saw, some, you know, we saw some gains. So for example, the, the share of children that were out of school had fallen. The incidence of many communicable diseases was, was in decline. Um, access to safe drinking water was improving, and, and also women's representation in, in leadership roles was increasing. At the same time, we saw the number of people suffering from, from food insecurity was already on the rise. The natural environment you know, continues to deteriorate at a very alarming rate, and, and we have seen dramatic levels of inequality um, all over the world. So change was happening, but it wasn't really happening at the speed or scale that was required. Um, and then, you know, the pandemic hit. And obviously, we now have an unprecedented um, health, economic and social crisis that is making the achievement of the goals even more challenging. You know, I'd say many health systems in many countries are, you know, have been driven to the, to the brink of collapse. The livelihood of, of half the global work, uh, workforce has been affected. We've got more than a billion students that have been out of school for uh, longer periods of time. 
and, and millions of people are being pushed back into, into poverty and hunger. And although the pandemic, you know, obviously affects every person in every community, it, it doesn't do that equally. Um, instead, I would say that it has exposed and exacerbated um, existing inequalities. You know, in vast uh, economists, we saw that fatality rates were, were highest in, in marginalized groups and in developing countries, those who are the most vulnerable, you know, including indigenous people, um, people who are employed in the informal economy, um, people with disabilities, etc., migrants, refugees have been hit even harder. And again, globally, women and girls um, have been affected disproportionately. So, you know, that's quite a stark picture. Now, in our most recent report, um, it is very clear that sustainability professionals also continue to be really critical about progress that's been made. Um, and actually, the percentage of people who uh, reported progress being poor went up from 49 to 54% compared with uh, the past two years. Um, only 4% of people surveyed believe that progress has been excellent. And those negative perceptions kind of vary based on where you are in the world, what sector you're operating in, and the experience that people have. So it was European experts, people working in, in academia and research, and those who have more than 10 years experience in sustainable development, who were all um, perhaps most negative with regards to, to progress made. Interestingly, people who are working, sustainability professionals who are working in corporates were actually uh, more positive. And if you look at the Latin American, um, you know, kind of um, performance, it was sort of mixed with a score of 49%. Then if we're looking at uh, progress with regards to, you know, individual SDGs, mo most of all, um, they were rated as poor rather than good and particularly uh, progress on, on SDGs around reduced inequality, life on land and life on water were, were rated very negatively. Uh, where we saw more positive um, ratings was around industry innovation and infrastructure, partnerships for the goals and, and, and some progress around affordable and clean energy. Now, if we're looking at you know, which of the SDGs were, were seen as either most urgent or where most, most progress was made, climate action continues to be the SDG identified as requiring the most urgent action. Then life on land, reduced inequalities and responsible consumption and production are kind of tied in terms of uh, being uh, second most urgent. Although reduced inequality had, has increased quite a lot compared to 2019. So this scatter plot is, is kind of looking at that um, nexus between urgency and progress. And, and it's interesting to see that climate action, whilst being rated as very urgent, progress is not that great. The one goal where we are seeing some, uh, you know, some in the right hand corner uh, is, uh, is around quality education. But then some of the other goals where progress has been perceived as being positive, um, again, those around industry innovation infrastructure, um, and, you know, and, and, and partnership for the goals, they're also being seen as being less urgent. So, you know, that's, that's disappointed. Then last, with regards to the effects uh, of the pandemic, you know, more than half of the experts say that the pandemic uh, will indeed slow progress on the SDGs. And that rate is even higher in Latin America. So I would say that far from undermining the case for the SDGs, you know, the root causes and, and the very uneven impacts of the pandemic demonstrate precisely why we need this decade of action um, and why we, why we need the SDGs. It's, it's, yeah, it's a stark picture. I was, I was, I think, pleased to see Latin America uh, at least sort of middle of the pack as opposed to the bottom of the pack. But uh, I fear that this, this latest uh, COVID impacts, I mean, we've seen, like you mentioned, the already poor performance on inequality, the, the just impact on, on society and schools and women in the, in the region. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's, uh, it's really, uh, it's just tough to, to look at these. Uh, but let me, let me pivot a little bit because you did point to the sort of highest uh, uh, rating or score um, around in industry and innovation infrastructure. So let me let me ask you about corporations and business um, and what business can do to accelerate um, these SDGs and actually you know improve upon what you've noted here in performance and outlook. Um, and I think there's a two-part question there about the role of the private sector and business, but, but about 
internal performance or internal uh, support and acceleration and collaboration externally. So take maybe those two pieces of what business can do and, and, and share with us your results. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And, and what I would say, given that we're nearly six years into the SDGs, I am assuming that most companies have now at least gone to the exercise of mapping their SDG, in fact, um, through engaging their key stakeholders. And with that, I would say across your value chain, so not just in your core business, but also with your suppliers and your customers, take into account both positive and negative impacts, and then also consider direct and indirect impacts. So, you know, direct might be your employment practices, indirect might be, you know, how your product is being used by, by consumers. The next, um, I would say every business should ask themselves the following questions. Firstly, where can I as a business make the greatest contribution that is aligned with my core business? Secondly, what is the SDG plan of the governments in the countries where I operate? And how can I really help them achieve identified priorities? And then thirdly, how can you use your influence and leverage to, to change really systemic challenges? So that might be, for example, improving the safety performance um, amongst your contractors or supporting uh, a living wage in your, in your supply chain. And then last, you mentioned it, Jeremy, you know, how can you collaborate with others? And then that can be within your sector or across your whole value chain to, to accelerate action. And then once you are clear as a business on where you can make uh, the greatest impact, you need a plan. Um, and that plan should really engage all of your operations. So for example, your HR function in terms of your employment practices, um, diversity and inclusion, skills and development, et cetera, your procurement departments to you know, really be able to engage with your supply chain, but then also research and development and, and, and new business lines you know, to, to really discover what kind of products or services are needed to meet the challenges and what can you as a business do to contribute to that. And then obviously the leadership, which is where a lot of that collaboration with, with other businesses and, and, and societal leaders might happen. I've also seen some businesses taking really innovative approaches to engage their entire workforce. For example, Fijutsu um, you know, started a program called the SDG Tribes, where they basically encouraged every um, employee to pick an SDG that they felt particularly passionate about. Um, and then to collaborate with like-minded colleagues on, on what can be done to, to further objectives around each of the, these SDGs. And then last, you know, every business should really look to report. It's really important to, to track your impacts and to disclose them publicly. And that should describing both your positive impacts, which everybody likes to, to, to shout about, but also the negative ones and, and what are the plans to address them. I would make a point around data um, because that needs to be robust and credible. And, and in, the, in the recent 2020 UN SDG report, there is a specific call for increased and, and innovative action on improving data, which is still severely lacking in, in many dimensions. And I think business has a particular role to play there. Now, if we go back to our um, survey, we see that there is some consistency in the goals that are being prioritized by, by business. Um, climate action very much at the top, um, but also responsible consumption and production, um, you know, frequently mentioned. And we're seeing both gender equality and quality education kind of rising in terms of uh, the attention that is getting within, within business. What I would say, though, is that the targets around zero hunger, peace, justice and strong institutions and no poverty get very little priority um, within business. And maybe that's a question. Um, you know, to be asked, like, you know, what else can business do around these goals? So back over to you. Yeah, it's, it's you know, I, I guess I'm not surprised by climate action. Um, it's pretty steady, 41, 43, 44. Obviously, it, it's, it's dominating these kinds of discussions. But um, the gender equality moving up, but like you said, the, the poverty and hunger issues being so down the pecking order and continuing to receive scarce attention is, um, you know, again, when we come back to when you add in the, the COVID-19 uh, issues and impacts, it's, it's just, it's, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't bode well um, for, for performance uh, increase acceleration on those. But, um, well, I, I want to pivot, you know, the, La the Latin America portion, you talked and shared some, some, some numbers from that earlier, but let's, let's actually go a little bit deeper into that. This is, you know, uh, a Latin America conference. This is a conference about energy and sustainability trends and issues 
in, in the Western Hemisphere, in Latin America. Um, so without, you know, forcing you to repeat so, some of the, but let's let's go right into more Latin American oriented uh, numbers and in, in, in performance and share with us just exactly how the region's done um, on SDGs and where we are vis-a-vis -vis Latin America. Yeah, yeah, happy to. So I work with some of my colleagues in, in Latin America and, and the Caribbean to, to form a view on this question. Uh, and I've also been looking at some of the, uh, of the current research. Um, you can see a picture here of the 2019 SDG index for Latin America and the Caribbean, which was uh, developed by the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. And they are scoring country performance. And basically 100 is a really good score and zero is, is bad performance. Uh, performance is analyzed by SDG and then it gets aggregated um, by, by country. And, you know, I would say that the main conclusion of, of this analysis um, is as follows. Overall, Latin America is lagging in meeting the SDGs. And this was four years after the approval of the, of the agenda. The average um, index stands at um, 63.1. And the report really points out that none of the 24 countries is performing as expected to meet the 2030, uh, the 2030 or the goals by 2030. Progress in the region has really been threatened by you know, increases in unemployment, inequality, uh, poverty, and, and, and hunger. And that combination can, can very well lead to more of, a, of the social conflict and unrest that we're already seeing in countries like Colombia, Ecuador, Bolivia, and, and Chile. Having said that, Chile, Uruguay, and Costa Rica are, are the best performing countries. Uh, and Brazil and Mexico, you know, some of the larger economies are in position seven and eight, uh, respectively. You can see Guatemala and Haiti, uh, you know, being lowest rank. Um, I would say that lack of innovation, income inequality, and, and insecurity, you know, are being quoted as the most pressing challenges across the region. And also a kind of relatively low expenditure on, on R&D matched with a kind of widespread feeling of insecurity in some countries, high homicide rates and, and growing corruptions. They're all additional factors. And then add on top of that, you know, COVID, which, you know, is expected to have a major adverse impact on, on social and economic go goals. Um, it is very likely that throughout the region, uh, we can expect underperformance on SDG number one, which is pover around no poverty, SDG eight, decent work and economic growth, and SDG 10 with reduced inequalities. But also progress that was made on SDG three, which is around good health and well-being, you know, is going to be impacted by the pandemic. And you know, countries are really going to have to to look for long-term strategies to become more resilient. Um, so it's a Pretty tough road ahead, uh, but it is really great to see the attention on this topic by by your organization. I say, um, you know, more needed than than ever. Well, yeah, and I think you know, for all the reasons you've just highlighted, you know, we need every, every organization. And in fact, um, you know, one of the things we'll talk about in the conference this week is the Biden administration's climate and energy plan for the region. And you know, with like you said, what's gone on in Colombia just in recent days, and in the tragedy, you know, of, of the societal response to a, a tax reform, you know, and these kinds of things, um, it it really puts under the microscope just just how tenuous the situation is in in all of these areas. And what's what can the U.S. do? What can the U.S. Uh, and with this new administration, not just in the climate, but sort of a comprehensive regional strategy? We've heard a lot about Central America. Um, you know, there's there's increasing migration based upon all of these things you've noted in terms of hunger and insecurity and, and inequality. Um, so I, I don't want to end on a really <laughs> down down uh, you know negative note here. So um, what, what do you think? I'll, I'll I'll just throw a question at you to end here. And, and, and are you optimistic that you know as we at least come out of it looks like we're coming out of the you know the other side of the pandemic, hopefully later this year, early next year, will we be able to sort of you know resume and, 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 you know, pick back up and be optimistic, particularly about climate action and maybe a couple of the other SDGs that you showed, you know, scoring and performing well over the years? Yeah, I mean, yeah, as I said, it's a tough road ahead, but I'm, you know, I, I'm definitely optimistic of, uh, as well about what, what lies ahead. Um, you know, I think we've learned a lot through the pandemic. What I would say is that particularly in business and with investors, um, ESG, you know, right. which, which you can take as a proxy for, for you know, to, to some extent for, you know, contributing to the SDGs is higher on the agenda than ever. So I think business will have an extremely uh, important role to play. 
And then combined with you know, a number of countries you know, having set out roadmaps, you know, now a, a potential for increased cross-country collaboration, you know, a, a, you know, a different um, administration in the US, you know, all those things are, are, are definitely going to help. Um, you know, of, of course, you know, the vaccination programs, you know, being rolled out, we, we're yeah. seeing in the countries where that is, where that is happening, that is having a, you know, a really positive effect. So, you know, there's, there's a lot to, to, to play for. And, you know, it's just, you know, we, what we need is exactly what you're doing is, you know, increased um, focus on these issues um, and having them right at the top of the agenda. No, thank you. I mean, in fact, we have a panel this year. I don't think we've, you know, has been so specific ESGs and, you know, and invest in where, how, how it's infecting the flow of capital. <clears throat> and it's exactly that. And I, I, I want to emphasize a point you made as well, which is the role of companies in, in leveraging and in, in actually, you know, making sure inside their own organizations and then outside leveraging their stakeholders and leveraging their employees and leveraging their, uh, you know, their resources to ensure that governments that are extremely strained these days in our region um, can have time to catch up and have you know the opportunity. So let's hope the private sector can continue to, to play a, a key role here um, in this area in you know acceleration of the SDGs, ESG, et cetera. So uh, we'll have to leave it there. This has been great. Uh, it's a wonderful addition. Sabine Hofnagel from ERM, thank you for joining us and sharing the results of your uh, survey and analysis. As I mentioned, it's always great to have ERM with us and great to meet you. Thank you so, so much, Jeremy. It was a real pleasure to, uh, to be at the conference.